Hey, uh, I think it's a little bit too loud. Um, so I wanted to talk about social aspects of open source. And for those of you who've been here on Wednesday in the main track, I gave a small over overview. So some of the, the first slides are the same, but then I will expand in more detail. Um, so one, one of the things I, I, I mean, open source is so popular and, and it's just uh, such an incredible thing, really, if you, if you think about it. There is so much great technology, but what I really like is the whole community around open source, like coming to a conference like this, you know, meeting people from all around the world and just on a daily basis participating in open source projects, collaborating with people all around the world. It, it just, it's just really exciting. Um, but at the same time, for people who are new to open source, sometimes it can be a little bit challenging. You know, how do you get started? Or what are the things you have to consider? What are the things you have to avoid? Um, so I'm going to talk about some of these social aspects. Um, and so first of all, um, a lot of people talk about the open source community. Um, and and I think and I think that's uh, to some extent is a mistake um, because there are actually many many different open source communities and they differentiate themselves in many different ways. So you can you can't assume that every open source project works in the same way. If you look at different projects, they actually operate in different ways. And if you want to get engaged, you need to know what the differences are. And so some of those dif differences can be in terms of technologies, right? Uh, you know, some you know different programming languages, um, or, or, or the different things they do, and then uh, um, some differences can be in terms of the the infrastructure. Um, you know, what kind of bug tracking system does the project use? What kind of CI system? Th there is a lot of a lot of diversity out there. Um, even though nowadays with GitHub. I think I think uh, a lot of projects are using the same sort of infrastructure and processes. But if if you look at some of the large open source projects, they have their own infrastructure. You know, they have different bug checking systems or just different ways of doing things. And then the processes are also different. Like how, for example, do you submit a patch? I mean, nowadays in many cases it, it just submit a you know a, a pull request. Um, but sometimes you have to send patches to mailing lists. Like there are different ways of doing things. Or how do you get the the change accepted? Um, also, how do you become you know an official developer in the project? Um, th there are a lot of different like a lot of differences. Uh, another area is governance. So how does the project work? How how does it operate? How does it govern itself? Um, we have some projects where you have sort of a committee, uh, some projects wi which has several, you know, core members, core contributors, and then some projects where you have like one benevolent dictator uh, who at the end of the day makes, makes the decision. Another difference is in terms of philosophy. Um, so, and you can see that in a number of ways, just in how projects approach things. One good example is licensing where on the one hand you have permissive uh, licensed projects like BSD, Apache, which basically the philosophy is you know, freedom, open source means that you can do whatever you want, uh, and that includes taking the software proprietary. But then on the other hand you have the, like the, the copyleft people who basically say, well, the software, the freedom needs to be preserved for everyone. Um, so that means you can't do everything. Um, and then another difference is the culture, just just how you know the project is, uh, how how things happen. Um, so, so I I'm involved in Debian, and I can I can tell you a lot of things about Debian. You know, it is one of the most popular Linux distributions. We have a lot of packages. We've done a lot of cool stuff, and and I could go for all of that, but I'm I'm going to skip it now, because when I think of Debian, really. I think of the community. I think this is what really makes Debian special. And you can see here a picture of the world where the various Debian developers are found. So we have a lot of people in Europe, uh, a lot of people in America, and then we, we do have some people in Asia, um, although I'd like to see more people. Another picture is this. So once a year we have a conference, DebConf. Um, and this is from DebConf in, in Edinburgh. And this is really, for me, what Debian is all about, that those people, 
and I've been involved in Debian for, for about 20 years now, and, and some of those people I've known you know, for, 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 for 20 years, and it's, it's just amazing how you know, we grow up together, we, we see how people change, and also you know, when I travel, I, I, can, I, I know people everywhere <laughs> around the world. You know, I can meet up with people, I can maybe stay at their places, and this is just really incredible. What, what open source has allowed me to do is to, to understand different cultures, work with those people. Um, so community has, has a number of aspects. Um, so one is etiquette uh, and norms, uh, like basically how, how you behave, or how you, you know, do things or things you shouldn't do. Then there are also rit rituals. Um, uh, like you know, certain things we tend to do, which sort of show that you are part of this community. And another thing that's important is history. So sometimes when you when you when you come to a project and you knew, you look at something and you're like, why are they doing things in this particular way? Like it doesn't make sense. You know, if 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 you would do it, you would do it in a different way. But then you go back in history. And you see, oh, be because of this thing, you know, which happened 10 years ago, this is why, you know, things are the way they are now. Um, and and with open source, it's it's really interesting because a lot of the, the history is actually available in you know mailing list archives, so you can actually find out, you know, why things are the w the way they are. And 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 that also includes like things like. <laughs> like personality conflicts. I mean, <laughs> we just have, have to be honest. Uh, open source. Uh, I mean, it, it involves people, and generally, we want to work together. We want to collaborate, but obviously, not everyone gets you know uh, along with each other. And and the history, you know, that might also explain certain things. You know, maybe you know something was implemented to work around someone, uh, or things like that. Um, and I mentioned rituals, and, and actually let me go back, because this is such a good example. So you can see here, so this is in Edinburgh, in Scotland, uh, where people were killed. And so basically Debian um, got some kills done, and we actually have our own pattern. So Debian actually has a specific kill pattern. And, and it's quite interesting, because nowadays when you go to DebConf, you can always see some people wearing, uh, you know, wearing kilts. And if you see them, you might think, oh, well, they're probably Scottish, right? That's why they wear it. But no, actually, it's, it's a Debian tradition. <laughs> I mean, not everyone wears it, but some people do. And, and you only understand it, again, if you look at the history of, of how these things happened. Um, and now people, people also show it to show you know, that they are part of the project, that they belong to this community. Sometimes we also talk about tribes. You know, you belong to this tribe. Um, so anyway, so back to, to norms and, and etiquette. So the thing is with humans is that violating community norms is, is really bad. It, it just, it's very obvious if you, if you get something wrong. And it's interesting that for Asia, I'm here in, in Asia because I'm from Europe. And when I travel to Asia, I get things wrong, right? And, uh, and again, I, I probably shouldn't even say Asia because there is a big difference between Singapore and a lot of the other countries. But for example, in Europe, when I eat noodles, you know, I'm not allowed to make any noise because if I make noise, that's impolite. But I think here, um, you know, I, I have to make noise. It shows that I, I like the food. Um, and there are a lot of these, these norms that as like a foreigner, you don't know. You know, when I come here, I do things which which violates your norm, and and it's very obvious. But the thing is, you also see, oh, you know, he's a foreigner. He he is not supposed to know all of those things. You know, you you cut me some slack. Um, and it's the same with open source. So one example is email, because um, usually our interaction is based on email, and that's how you make your first impression. They always say, you know, the first impression, how, you know, when you meet someone for the first time, that's the, the, the most important. And your first impression with open source is probably going to be on an email, uh, on a mailing list. You send an email, and some people get it wrong. Um, and, and again, I mentioned before that there isn't the open source community. A lot of the things I say now only apply to more traditional open source communities. A lot of the more 
newer ones actually are quite different in this way. But historically, sending stuff like HTML email to a mailing list, like people really, really hate it. And if you do that, it's obvious you're a foreigner. You know, you you don't know how the project works. You're not from here. You're not one of us. Um, some some people also send garbled patches because they use stu they use stuff like Outlook. Um, uh, another thing I often see is long email footers. So especially companies, they have those legal requirements to state, you know, the address and the CEO and all those details, tax numbers, and it's like 20 lines of of, of email. And people, in the at least in the past, again things are changing, really hate that kind of stuff. And another another example is top posting, and this is actually a really good example which also shows that these norms change over time. So in the past, if you would uh, top post to a mailing list, so top post just means that you write your reply at, you know, at the top of the email, like people would really, really hate it. Like you would have to do it this way. You know, you quote and then you send your reply, you quote some more. This is inline. And in a lot of a lot of you know the traditional open source communities, like this is how you have to respond. If you if you top quote, people hate it. But this is actually such a good example of things changing because now top quoting is getting much 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 more you know widely uh, uh, used, and I, I also do it sometimes. So. Um, so what, what I'm trying to say, so I don't know if you know this, this comic, uh, where is Wal Waldo? I think Waldo has different names in, in, in all kinds of different languages. Um, but you have to, to find him somewhere on the picture and he's really hard to find. And, and that's what I'm trying to say is that when you join a community, you don't want to stick out in a negative way. You know, you should try to blend in. You should try to learn the culture and do things in, in, in the way that the community expects. But at the same time, of course, you should, you should build a reputation for yourself. You know, you should stick out in a positive way by making a good contribution. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, corporate involvement and because it's it's getting much more common nowadays that people like software engineers who have like a tr traditional corporate background and they are being told oh you know you should work on this open source project we want to get engaged um you know can you start working on this open source um project and the culture between you know a corporate environment where you do in-house development can be quite different to the open source world um, and sometimes that's a big learning curve for people. Um, so one example is writing down information. In open source, we really like writing down everything. We enjoy you know, communicating on the mailing lists which are archived or in chat systems which, which are archived. And this has a lot of benefits because other people can get involved, they can read what's going on and they can participate. But a lot of a lot of the corporate culture is to just you know get a room and talk about stuff, and sometimes corporations even avoid writing down stuff because you know they don't want to be taken accountable later. Um, another thing is distributed development versus co-located development. So if if the whole team is in the same building, you know you get used to just shouting across the aisle. Um, and again, if everyone is in the same building, you just get a meeting, you talk about it, and then everyone knows what's going on, but there is no need to really write it down. But with open source, we always need to write things down. Um, and sometimes we meet at conferences and have you know, chats in person, but then it's important to go back to the mailing list to document what you have discussed, what you have decided, because there are a lot of people from the project who won't be able to be at the conference. Um, t technologies obviously are, are different as well, um, but I think the you know, learning the open source uh, technologies and tools is very easy. Um, and something that some people need to do is if they work in a, co in a corporate environment, 
they need to adopt different styles. You know, if you if you work internally, uh, you know, in the corporate environment, you have to behave a certain way. You have to follow their traditions and their rules. But then, if you work on the open source project, you have to adopt a different style and you have to do what they do. So this is sort of a skill that you you need to you know work in different ways depending on on what you do. Um, another big difference is is being open. Community is all about being open. You know, the, the work is is in the open, and and this, to be uh, to be honest, can be a big challenge for people, especially if you're new to open source. Because internally, if you if you create a patch, yeah, your colleagues, your manager might review it. They might give you some feedback. You, you may have to change it. But if you do it in open source, suddenly the whole world can look at your changes and they can critique them, right? And this stuff is archived, <laughs> you know, forever. And this can be a little bit scary. Um, and, and again, that's also a cultural thing, because, like, for example, in America and the US, you know, they're quite direct with giving feedback. Um, and they can be quite blunt, whereas in some Asian cultures, it, it's, you know, it's all about saving face and, you know, saying things indirectly. So this is a big challenge, I think, for a lot of Asian contributors to be involved in open source, which are really, uh, like the culture is very, very Western dominated in many ways. Um, another thing which, which is like a, like a challenge for some people, but I find it really rewarding, is that with open source, you work with your competitors. Um, like obviously your companies compete on some in some ways, but on the open source project, you might collaborate, you know, with them. So if you look at the Linux kernel, you know, that has people from Intel and AMD working together side by side. IBM um, and HP are working on Linux side by side, but then they compete in other areas. Um, so this is something which, which is very, you know, unusual in a way. And I actually have this example. Um, so I, I have a friend, and he used to work at HP. Um, so I used to work at HP. We both worked at HP, and he was working on the Linux kernel. And then one day he moved on. I can't remember. He moved to Google or Red Hat, but he still continued working on the Linux kernel. And so he told me that his his family asked, "Oh, so you changed jobs? What are you doing now?" And he said, "Oh, I do exactly the same I do before. You know, I worked on the Linux kernel before." And I work on the Linux kernel now. And they were like, how can you change employer and still do the same stuff? <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and I think it's incredible because, again, it comes back to friendships. Even though we change employers, you know, my friends, they still stay around in the same, you know, environment. Yeah, we might work for different employers, um, but we all work on the same project. Um, yeah, documentation, NDA can be a problem with like corporate involvement. So one of the questions is why should you get involved in open source in the first place? Because open source, it means, you know, you can do anything. You can take the software, um, you can modify it internally in your corporate environment. There is no need, there is no requirement to give it back. Um, but there are a lot of benefits in doing so, because at the end of the day, upstream, so upstream is basically the project where you get the software from, um, they are the authoritative source. So if you make changes internally, the project does, doesn't stand still. They also move on and they make changes. And then for you, it's a, it's a huge maintenance requirement um, to, to, you know, get your changes into the new version. But instead, if you take your changes and you put them upstream, then you can just adopt the new version without any changes. And in fact, other people might get involved and improve the changes you have made. Um, so, so one of the things I see in terms of co corporations getting involved in open source is they don't understand that in the long term, open source pays off. But in the short term, it can be more work because you need to get up to speed to contributing to the project. You need to do all that work to get your changes in. And that's a lot of work. 
but in the long term, it makes things so much easier for you. So this is sometimes a challenge explaining to management, you know, why do you need to work to invest all of that time now? Well, because it pays off in the long term. <coughs> another f another reason for getting in uh, involved upstream is getting new ideas. I always, I mean, you know, some of the big companies like Google, they hire a lot of smart people, right? But there is no single company that can hire all the smart sm smart people in the world. And again, that's the beauty of open source is that. You know, you have all those smart people working on the same project, and it doesn't really matter who they work for. You get those ideas from all of those people, and you can also, also contribute your ideas. So how, how to get started with open source? So it's very hard to give like a step-by-step -step how to, because a lot of the things depend on the project. You know, every project works in a different way, so the way you get engaged, the way you contribute, are very specific to the project. Um, but obviously, some of the things are generic. So one thing I always recommend is that people start by using the software. And then when you use the software, I'm sure you're going to find things that don't work. And then you can find a bug report. Or maybe the documentation is accurate, and you can improve it. Um, and the more you help out, the more opportunities you find to get involved. Um, another thing that's important is that in open source, you have to be very independent. There isn't really anyone in open source who tells you, oh, you know, you should be doing this, you should be doing this. It's very, like, people are very self-determined. Like, you get involved, you do something, and you contribute it. So don't wait around for people to tell you what to do. Just do something. And, and uh, I mean, a lot of projects nowadays try to make it easier by having sort of mentorship programs where they either describe certain things that are easy to do. You know, here are some bug reports uh, which are easy to fix, or here is, you know, a documentation area that can be improved. And also they provide guidance, like they work with you um, to, to get you up to speed. But a lot of projects don't have that. So you just need to get started um, and, then, and then contribute and see how things work. Um, so one of, one of my advice is find a niche. Find something that hasn't been done before. Because if you just do something which everyone does, well, you can make a contribution, but it, it's, it's going to be, you know, but if you do something completely different, then, you know, your impact is much higher. So, and in open source, there's always something to do. Like, no software project is perfect, right? No project is finished. There is always something you can contribute. So just start by using the project, and you're going to find a ton of stuff that you can improve. Um, one of the really nice things about open source is that as you get engaged in projects, you build up a reputation. You know, people start to recognize your name, and if you do a good work, they will you know, they will associate your name with that good work. They know they can trust you. They know that if you do something, it's going to be high quality. And the great thing is that re that reputation, if you want to change employers, that stays with you. You know, people can look at your your GitHub, uh, you know, repository, or they know na your name, and that makes it really easy to get new jobs. Um, so how to get involved? So one of the things I always say is, I mean, I'm sure you're eager to get involved, you just want to start, but take things slow. The first thing you should do is observe. Observe how the project operates. And the great thing is with open source, this is very easy to do. You can just subscribe to a number of mailing lists and you can read and then you can see how people interact, how do people discuss, how do people make decisions, who are the people who have influence in the project? You see all of this just by observing, you know, the, 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 the mailing list conversations. Um, <coughs> and try to understand the culture. Try to figure out how the project works. And don't assume that it works a certain way, that it works like a company or that it works like, a, like another open source project. And yeah, if you make um, changes, um, then contribute them back.
Um, so that's it. So I think we have some time for, for questions. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, one idea that I've been uh, that I've been toying uh, toying around with is for uh, for companies to uh, uh, more so traditional companies to implement an open source culture uh, within the company um, itself. Um, I'm just wondering if you have seen this uh, done anywhere. Um, so uh, so make sure that there are no sort of Clans inside the company, if people are open about the work that they're doing, and invite other departments in to come and take a look and for codes within the company, and then spin that off. Uh, see, see the advantage of having multiple uh, uh, stakeholders and contributors, and then spin that off in finally into an external project after the uh, momentum has been built up. Uh, right. Yeah. Do you have yeah. any comments on that? Uh, I think there are there are two things I see. Um, so one of them is called inner source, uh, which is basically where companies adopt open source methodologies um, internally. So you know they use stuff like like Git and pull requests and 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 bug bug tracking systems and and basically they adopt open source methodologies internally. Um, but sometimes it is for proprietary code, so there's never any plan to actually, you know, up like get it open, so like get it out 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 of the door. It's just internally to to facilitate collaboration. And for example, when I worked at HB, we actually um, bought a license for GitHub um, to 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 create this this environment. And people were saying, like. I mean, it was like a big company with 300,000 people, and it was like, you know, why are there so many silos? Why are the different teams not working together? Why do we not know what the other people are doing? And by having this inner source, I you know, some of those challenges can be addressed. But then I, I think the other thing is, which I think is more aligned to what you said, is is where people sort of start doing open source internally but with, with the plan to, to eventually get it out there. So one thing, for example, I see is that you might have a team uh, where you have some experienced open source developers and some people who don't have the experience and basically they provide some internal coaching. So you do stuff internally, uh, there's internal code review and once the, the, the team decides, yeah, it's ready, then you approach the open source project, you actually submit it outside. Um, but, but yeah, like the whole inner source model is, is getting quite, quite popular. And, and yeah, hopefully some of that will be released as open source as well. But some of it is just, you know, proprietary software development done in like a more modern way. Any other? Actually, I have a question. So uh, archiving this uh, email list and PRs, uh, so those have kind of a personal comment or like information. Does it anything violate uh, GDPR <laughs> these things or anything? Because it's archived forever, right? Right. So this this is actually a really big topic for for a lot of open source projects right now because we have traditionally relied on, on, I mean, open source is all about being open, about being transparent. We don't want to hide, you know, problems or, 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 or things. So we, you know, the whole idea is to, to archive stuff as, as mu much as possible. But at the same time, you know, projects need to comply with, with the, you know, the law. 
and and so now you know if someone wants something removed the, the, the project will have to do that um, I, I don't think I think it takes some more time to see how it pans out in reality I don't think we have seen like a lot of you know requests for removal but it's definitely something that, that the various projects are, uh, are aware and working on Any other questions? We have like two and a half minutes. Okay. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, please give a round of applause for Martin McLeod.